Hi, it's Laura Giles, your host of Modern Animism Radio. I have guests with me today, Lisa Giles, who is the secretary on the board of Pan Society, and Rick West, who is one of our founders, will be talking with me today about poetry. Uh, it's an obvious part of any earth-based spiritual path, as many poems are inspired by nature herself. And maybe you've even written some. Um, but before we get into that, let's pause to give gratitude to the elements and ancestors. Acknowledge and thank the lovely earth for our foundation, stability, tenacity, beauty, sensuality, and all the tangible things that make a human life human. I acknowledge and thank the air for the ability to communicate, think, inspire, and innovate. Thank you for carrying our prayers and whispers to our ancestors and theirs to us. I acknowledge and thank fire for warmth life, purification, desire, and the drive to get up and go, make, create, and do things with our lives. I ask that you ignite our passion for love, connection, and healing so that we can do healing things that ripple throughout our tribe in a big, healthy way. I acknowledge and thank water for making life on this planet possible, for reminding us to flow, for guiding us through our emotions, for taking us into deep places to stimulate uh, growth, and I ask that you give us momentum to come back out again into the world and find ourselves purified by the experiences. I acknowledge and thank the ancestors from the plant, animal, mineral, and human realms for all that you do that is seen and unseen. I thank you, our listeners, for tuning in and giving us your support. If you benefit, um, please help us to grow by sharing our podcast or donating to the program, and you can do that at buymeacoffee.com forward slash pan society. I think, it's my impression, if you live in the modern world, you may not think of poetry as being spiritual because most people think of man as having dominion over nature instead of being part of it. And I don't know of any poetry books that are flying off the shelves just now. So I think it's not something that modern people really invest in. Maybe, maybe we'll find out today that that's not true. Um, but I think that's a shame. And I don't know how you can live close to nature or even go out and enjoy it and not be inspired by it. Um, because it, it does connect us. Um, with nature, with, with something bigger than ourselves. Um, Lisa, I know you want to talk about Emerson today. Um, what do you think? <laughs> well, when you asked me to be part of this podcast and told me the theme, I instantly thought about Emerson and the Transcendentalists and Thoreau and Emily Dickinson and all those poets who were famous for nature poetry. And not a lot of people think about nature poetry as being exciting or, you know, like, oh, whatever, I'd rather talk about love, you know. But, but once upon a time, I was an English major, and once upon a time, I was an uh, English teacher, and I taught high school English 11th grade. And the curriculum for 11th grade English is American literature. So that, you know, from the beginning were letters that people on the Mayflower wrote. It was letters, you know, epistolary technique. That was the literature, you know, from the very beginnings to what we have now. And then somewhere in between um, were these transcendentalists. And Emerson is probably my favorite. Um, and, and the piece that I immediately thought of was nature. And Emerson was a, he was a philosopher, he was a uh, educator, he was a, a, a poet, but this piece technically is not poetry, and I'm sorry if I broke the rules, it's technically prose, but it's very poetic, and it's much like his other stuff that is poetry. Um, so this is the one that I chose, um, it's called Nature, it's from 1836. Um, and again, if you, if you know anything about the Transcendentalists, um, they're, as far as I know, and as far as I believe, they're very close to animists. And, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, they're, they're you know, their philosophies are, are you know, in, in, in fact, they're often thought of as pantheists or pan-deists. Um, but anyhow, let's get to the work. Let's get to the work. <laughs> so the work, again, it's Nature from 1836. And this is a long piece, and I've, I've selected uh, pieces out of it. 
um, from the first part, um, chapter one, nature, the stars awaken a certain reverence because though always present, they are always inaccessible. I love that line because, you know, it's, it's saying there is, there is this majesty that has just such power and while you can enjoy it, you can never have it. It's not something to be had. And I think that's something that, that, that you see throughout this whole essay. Um, Nature never wears a mean appearance, neither does the wisest man extort all her secret and lose his curiosity by finding out all her perfections. Can't know everything. There's, there's always going to be something to learn or something to enjoy or something new to be to experience in the natural world. Um, and feel free to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I, I agree with that because I, I walk most days. And if you look, it's, it's never the same. And you can't go back, like you said, and capture it. So, for example, um, right now, since the winter solstice in, in January, we have two more minutes of daylight. And I'm usually at the same spot and I've been going here purposely for this reason because it's just so pretty. And just when I, right when I'm getting there, the sun is coming up over the trees and it's, it's just such a beautiful shade of gold and it just lights up the area. And I know that it's only going to be that way for a little longer because of that two minutes that's different every single day. And it makes me really, really present to be there in that space with that water, with that sun, with that cloud, with that sky. And it, it grounds me and it also makes me a part of everything in a way that I think just totally encapsulates animism. To me, that's, that's what it's about. It's, I mean, you could say all these things, blah, 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 the gods, the theories, the, the rituals, da, 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 but it's in that moment. That's, that's, so immediate that you can you blink your eyes and it's gone nature's first green is gold it's hardest <laughs> to hold robert exactly Ford. exactly yeah <laughs> stay stay gold yeah. Pony. <laughs> <laughs> okay back to emerson <laughs> right. um and this is this, this is again more of what you just said landscape which I saw this morning is indubitably made up of 20 or 30 farms. Miller owns this field, lock that, and manning the woodland beyond, but none of them owns the landscape. There is a property in the horizon which no man has but whose eye can integrate all parts. That is the poet. This is the best part of the, man, the men's farms, yet to this their land deeds give them no title gives them no title. You might own that, but you don't own that. Right. Own that vision. Yeah. And that, that's very Native American to me also. You very Native that. American. Yeah, yeah. You can't own that the land, or you shouldn't be able to own that land. Right. It's like, how, how, how did that, you know, and, it, and I, you know, you think about it when the white man came and said, no, this belongs to me. How that must have freaked out Americans like, what are you talking about? You can't have that. Right. And put a fence around it and then say, keep out. Yeah. Like all the other creatures that live there in the soil, on the soil, above, they, they don't have any right to that. That's just ridiculous because we belong to it and it belongs to us. And it's such a strange way to move around the world. It's such a disconnected way to move around the world. That it is. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I just said that it is. It's, it's, it's disconnected and uh, unhelpful, honestly. Yeah. And that's where I think this next piece comes in from Emerson. Few adult persons can see nature. So these, these people who can obviously mm -hmm. don't think that way. The lover of nature, the outward senses are still truly adjusted to each other, who has retained the spirit of infancy even into his era of manhood. His intercourse with heaven and earth becomes part of his daily food. This is something you need to survive, just like you need food. And, it, and to enjoy it, you have to have that innocence as, as like a just childlike innocence. Isn't that beautiful? I totally agree with that. Totally agree. Yeah. There's a, um, I wish I could remember exactly what it said, but there's, there's a teaching in, in the Tao that 
uh, you spend your life returning to, to that innocence of the, the babyhood, to be soft and supple like a baby in the womb. And not just, you know, your physicality, but your whole, everything, your mentality, because all this growing and all this learning, and you, it's, it's a way of removing yourself from your, your natural essence. And I think we do need to have a uh, childlike innocence to, to retain it, to see it, to live in it. And removing all of this junk that has clouded what the original you right know, that exactly is, that has, yeah you know, that yeah has, we're born perfect yeah ex exactly exactly and we forget yeah. with we're all born of our animals and, we're born yeah. as animals and, and we and, and yeah. to, to to understand well i think one of the things that poetry does is kind of get you back to your animal spirit yeah. it takes you back to that place where where um at its best, at its finest, at least. It takes us back to the place where we kind of get rid of those filters. We start seeing the world without the filter. In fact, I, I, language is, is a prison in, in a lot of ways. I mean, we're, we're kind of locked into the, the language that we speak, the language that we think in. And I've always kind of thought of poetry as, uh, you might say, jailbreaking language. It's a way, it's a way to, it's a way to um, use possibly the same words, but in different syntax, different structures uh, to create a different set of symbols so that we understand the world in a different way. And I th poetry at its best does that. And, and nature poetry, I think, takes us back to, a, back to a remove where a lot of the, 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 the I'll say modern life, but, but a, lot of the, a lot of the filters that we've placed upon ourselves Kind of disappear and it's as a writer i know it's very difficult to get to that to, to, to be able to to yeah. say things that, that that bring people back into themselves but at its best and finest that's what it does and here's how emerson said exactly what you just said In book two, a man casts off his years as the snake his and at what period soever of life is always a child it would <laughs> Yeah. that's great that's great isn't that amazing <laughs> <laughs> well i think that poetry can be so so let's say that i i grow up in the city uh you know on on asphalt all the time and i don't have a relationship with nature i think poetry can be the gateway for me to figure that out if I if I give myself permission to explore that because like I said in the intro I don't know a lot of people who read poetry at all and somehow we went from from I don't know if it's TV I don't know you know we went from a culture of people who liked storytelling and liked hearing this because poetry is meant to be read there's a sound to it there's a cadence to it that helps you to feel it read meant aloud spoken actually yes yeah, read, spoken. exactly yes, spoken. yes. Um, and we don't do that anymore, That's which true. I think is a loss. Mm. Right, right. And this this whole um, uh, the the transcendentalist movement, especially in the eighteen thirties, um, Emerson was one of these guys. I mean, think about where America was in the eighteen thirties, and thinking about you know, how the Europeans came over for the better way of life and number one, freedom of religion. And so when you have this freedom of religion, you know, this very puritanical background, Emerson and Thoreau, and these guys were standing up and saying, well, <laughs> you know, they were the first guys to say that, that divinity pervades nature and humanity divinity pervades nature and humanity so that god god is not this guy in the sky calling the shots god or whatever you feel like is religion or is your god is his nature it's all around god is in everything and this is what really turned me on to these transcendentalists is, is you know how how you know, again, God is not this being, this unknown being in the sky. God is all, God is all around, everywhere. You it's in you. It's in me. It's in the plants. It's in, it's in everything. And 
theory goes with, in the woods, we return to reason and faith. There, I feel that nothing can befall me in life, no disgrace, no calamity, which nature cannot repair. Standing on a bare ground, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being, capital U, capital B, the currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part and particle of God. And that's why I say that you might not claim to be an animist, but you are. <laughs> because we all are. We're all part of this oneness. And um, what I mean by, I mean, you can label yourself as whatever you want to label yourself as, but I see you as that. Because that, that is exactly how it feels. It's like we're all a part of this thing and we're all in it, you know, each doing our own thing, each believe in our own way. But there's no separation. There really right. is no separation. Right. At the core, no, there's not. Yeah. Right. So he uses this word God, but again, you know, the, the idea that divinity is in everything. Yeah. You know, whatever, whatever you, you know, you call, you know, your God, it's, you know, that, that's, that's all around you. Right. All around you. And I love how he says, uh, uh, where all mean egotism finishes when you're in nature, you can't be an asshole in nature. <laughs> you know, you can't be an asshole. You know, I love that. Uh, the great it's really hard. Yeah. Right. I mean, when you think about it, when, you know, one of the, one of the great joys, especially right now in this pandemic, is to go to the beach, man, to go to the beach, to take a hike, to have a picnic. You know, that's what we want to do. You know, that's what we want to do, you know, to, to, to be happy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Who doesn't like to go to the beach or to the woods or take a hike? <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know? I, um, I, before COVID, I took people on sacred travel adventures and we had this, and I never know who's going to show up. It could be anybody. And um, we had this woman one time who was an ass. <laughs> And you could just tell she's just cranky and um, because she was just complaining about everything and, you know, we're just like, okay, okay. And then by day two, she was a totally different person because we were outside every day under the sky, in the clouds, in the sunshine, and nobody said anything to her. Nobody, nobody called her out on, and you didn't have to. And I think it just opened you up to your true being. Now, I don't know where she came from before she got there or what, what she was dealing with it, but it, it left. And I mean, the whole group is, is always just really, really beautiful. And I think it's because we all return to ourselves when we get out in nature, yeah. our true selves. Yeah. Yeah. Here's, here's another passage that I, I just, I love so much and talking about how, how uh, divinity pervades all things. Uh, the greatest delight which the field and woods minister is the suggestion of an occult relation between man and the vegetable. I am not alone and unacknowledged. They know to me and I to them. That personification though, yeah. vegetables yeah. are alive. Yeah, he's an animus. <laughs> yeah, they, certainly. <laughs> yeah. They mentioned this like, hey, you know, talking to plants, you know, everybody, idea that talking to plants helps them grow it's That's right it is. Here it is. yeah <laughs> they're alive <laughs> okay here's the last piece that i want to share from this and then and then we can hand off but um nature is not always tricked in holiday attire but the same scene which was and this is kind of like what you said laura uh, they stop in holiday attire, but the same scene which yesterday breathed perfume and glittered as for the frolic of the nymphs is spread with melancholy today. Nature always wears the color of the spirit. That chick who was the asshole, mm -hmm. <laughs> mad at life. She was mad at you know at whatever, and then and you know and then her, and then it changed. Yeah. Nature wears the colors of the spirit. It reflect. It's a reflection of of what you're, you know, what 
what you're feeling and what what you're. It's true. It's true. Like um, so we had a bonfire. It was in the summer last year, and um, the purpose of it was to let go of whatever, it, whatever you need to let go of. And, you know, we're out there, we're up by the water, so it was just lovely. We have the sky above, the land below, the fire all around us, and you could see people, because we gave everybody the space to witness and to be present, you could see people going through their changes and just doing whatever they needed to do and releasing and being just who they were. So it was a really different way than the the one that I was just talking about where she just kind of softened because we went into hard spaces too um, and tough spaces. And, and I think, I, I really believe, especially the fire, but just nature itself helps to bring that out. If you just let it, you give yourself an opportunity to be there and just, just be there. It'll come out, whatever needs to come out. Good, bad, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for letting me share that. <laughs> Our favorite, favorite nature piece of all time. Well, maybe Thanks not of all that. time. Maybe not. Of, it's hard to say of all time. There's so many good ones. But anyway, thank you. So I'm, I'm not a poet, and but I have one that I wanted to share. Um, just to kind of let people know that you don't have to be a poet to write poetry. You only have to satisfy yourself. And um, so this, this poem came out. So I, I went to England. So when you leave from the East Coast, you leave at night, or in my case, I had to leave in the middle of the day because I had to get to my gateway city. So I'm leaving, it's like, let's say it's Friday at one o'clock. I'd leave the East Coast at like six o'clock, get to England in the morning. And I'm thinking that my car is right outside the airport. It wasn't. It was an hour bus ride away, which it was cold, it's rainy, it's an hour away. I haven't eaten, haven't slept. I'm like really tired. And then I finally get in my car and there's wall to wall traffic, insane traffic in the rain. And then you got these little tiny roads in Cornwall. It's like, you never know if there's a big bus coming around the corner or, or whatever. So I w all that to say is I was really, really tense when I get here. And it's, it's this place that I, I love. If I have an ancestral home, it's Cornwall. Um, it's just my, my peace place. And I'm in a really bad mood. I'm so hungry. I couldn't find the hotel. So that took a while too. And then this is what came out. <laughs> and um, I call it uh, falling in love in Cornwall. So takada takada takada. The wind battered flag tapped out a rhythm to the air inviting me to dance. Yes, I'd play. I'd seen this scene so many times, but never like this. And I needed something to put the smile back into my heart and the warmth into this cold, cold day. From the time I landed in England, she seemed determined to take my love away. Like the disillusioned lover who deep down thinks, if you only knew the real me, you would not love me. Cornwall put on her naughty face. I was hungry, tired, and dehydrated, so I wasn't in the mood. I didn't find her misty spit amusing. But greater than my irritation was my desire to love her the way I always had, to dance the way we always had. I once thought her scattered blossoms natural and wild, and now knew them to be cultivated beauty. As I stared into the shy flowers growing out of the tiny cracks, I contemplated the spirit of the person who would put it there. And the fierce wind, the flower had to withstand to show its face. Seeing past her mask and savoring her savagery made her all the more pleasing. If I thought I couldn't love her more, miss her more, I was mistaken. The wind, cold, noise, and gray only created a backdrop for me to see her beauty more clearly. And I stood there hopelessly enthralled anew, this time even more deeply snared, for now I've seen her whole face. Who's not a poet? That's beautiful. No. <laughs> that, that was not a poem? No, I said, who is not a poet? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My personification, though. <laughs> so I just think... I'm not here, though. <laughs> <laughs> I think if, if you just let something in, you can't help but to connect with it, to see it in a different way, and just to feel the God, like you were talking about, the spirit in it. And just, I, you just can't, you just can't. And it doesn't have to be something beautiful, stereotypically beautiful. It could be anything. Nature wears the colors of the spirit. That's right, yeah. yeah. Asshole in nature. <laughs> <laughs> he was an asshole at first, and he says, oh no, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> it was it was a really 
that was the first time I'd ever been there in those circumstances because it's always been really just just gushing with with abundance and beauty and and I'm really glad I experienced it that way um, because life is that way it's not always pretty and it's not always fun and it's even in the ugliness you can find the loveliness so what was the moment that changed your view in that trip mm, i think it was the flowers okay because they're so That's subtle nice. and they're so small and and you have this vast landscape of at that day ugliness and grayness because sometimes it's absolutely stunning in cornwall oh, yeah. Oh, and you know there's this little teeny spark of light right there just blowing in the wind and it's just like like a like a like a lighter clicking you know and you just see that spark and it blows up everything it's like oh okay mm -hmm. oh cool, cool. <laughs> yeah always trick your holiday attire yeah. i have i have i have a line for everything <laughs> <laughs> So Rick, you have one. <laughs> well, I went in a slightly different direction when you asked me to, uh, to, to take a look at uh, animism and poetry and nature and poetry. A um, couple different avenues I, I would take here. The, I, I wanna read a poem first, which is a, a modern, I, I'm not sure exactly what year, but uh, it's a woman by the name of Mary Oliver. Probably most of you know who she is. And the, the poem is called Wild Geese. And I just think it's great. And I'll read it because it's very short. Mary Oliver says, you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I'll tell you about mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. What, what moves me about that particular piece is, well, the, the first line is just, Fantastic. You do not have to be good. Nature doesn't really care. I, to, to back up for just a second, um, the, what, what I see is, is probably the, 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 the central piece of, of nature poetry is the way in which it brings ourselves. I, I think it's called personification. The, the, way, it brings, the way it connects us back to, to the reality of nature. And in fact, all the poems that I've, I've chosen or everything I was looking at is kind of in that line. It, 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 they're, they're about nature, but it's about our relationship to nature. And Mary Oliver is totally about our relationship to nature. And what she says is you don't have to be marvelous. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be. And if you listen, if you pay attention, it's all moving on without you, with you or without you, as John Lennon said. And it's how, whoever you are, whatever you are, if you just listen for a minute, it will take you back to where you need to be. It will, as she says, uh, announce your place in the family of things. And, and I, just, I just love that. That's, that's um, to me, that, that's sort of the, the, uh, the essence of, of nature poetry is taking us back. In fact, what, what I would like to kind of go to next is we're talking about um, kind of back in time, um, Japanese poetry, uh, haiku and tawa and ver ver the various uh, avenues of poetry that they have were very much centered on nature and natural beauty and natural poetry. And they used short, simple characters, very short, simple lines to express, well, let me just read one, to express very deep, deep sentiments. This is from uh, Hakushi. This is a haiku. He says, I write, erase, rewrite, erase again, and then a poppy blooms. That's just amazing to me. That's just amazing. I, I, I go through my whole process 
I screw up, I do it right, I do it wrong. Doesn't matter, the poppy's gonna bloom. I and love that. <laughs> yeah, that brought a smile to my face too. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And hey, I'm yeah, I think, I, I think that ahead, kind yes, of speaks to um, wild geese because it doesn't, it's not about being good. And I think yeah. one of the most harmful things that ever came about is this uh, judgment that comes with spirituality. You have to be good. There's something waiting for you if you're good. There's something waiting for you if you're bad. And that's really not <laughs> natural because mm. nature doesn't care. Yeah, it nature really does not care. care. <laughs> and, and, and the spirit world doesn't care either, no. by the way, just, just to put it out there. Here, here's one other uh, haiku that I just love. This is by a fellow by, by the name of Gosan, apparently written in 1789. Uh, it's sort of another theory, but, but same kind of concept. He says, the snow of yesterday that fell like cherry blossoms is water once again. The wheel, the wheel. He goes through yeah, the wheel. Exactly. That's, uh, and and I've always loved Japanese, um, the sort of the the, the, the poetic nature of, of their art in general, the movies, music, what have you, because it, it does it circles back around to this uh, this relationship of our flesh to to the, the the natural world, and and I just find it beautiful. Uh, we we can talk about that quite a bit. But before I uh, give up the microphone, I want to talk. I, I, want, to, I want to address this asshole thing. <laughs> <laughs> There's a fellow by the name of Robert Bly. I'm sure, and, and I know women think he's a complete asshole. I get that. I like Robert Bly. But, uh, do you? Okay. I do. Well, here, here's here's the piece from Robert Bly that um, again is short. I'll read it. It's 16 lines. It's not long. Uh, which I will be curious to hear your, your comment about. Robert, this blog was written, I think, in 1980. Says, this is, this is Robert Bly. He says, the soul said, give me something to look at. So I gave her a farm. She said, it's too large. So I gave her a field. The two of us sat down. Sometimes I would fall in love with a lake or a pine cone, but I liked her most. She knew it. Keep writing, she said. So I did. Each time the new snow fell, we would be married again. The holy dead sat down by our bed. This went on for years. This field is getting too small, she said. Don't you know anyone else to fall in love with? What would you have said to her? Sometimes in the, we can be in the very midst of the panacea. We, we, we can be in, in Eden, in paradise, and it's not quite right. And, and there's no amount of nature was going to save Robert Bly from, uh, from, from the field getting too small. <laughs> <laughs> which, I, which is, again, I, I, it circles back to this whole notion of, of how, na how, how, of, of this, this, cosmic interrelationship between ourselves, our bodies, our freedoms, our culture, our traps, and how that interrelates with nature. There's a very interesting, uh, I have one of my youngest sons, or my youngest son, almost never goes outside anymore. He's a great kid, you know, perfectly, I mean, you know, he's, he's normal. But these kids don't go outside anymore. They yeah. literally don't leave their rooms. I, well, I mean, they leave their room, but they don't, you know. I, I've said to him a few, are you joking? I said, you just invite him to bro. Uh-uh, I, I don't do that. <laughs> so, it's like, it's almost like they're becoming, a, a, I won't say a different species, but nature, the natural cycle of things is just not a part of that reality. And I've, I've uh, and I'm not like that at all. I mean, I've, I've grew up out, in the, you know, in the wild, basically, and I struggle to understand that. And I, I guess that's why I come up with with things like like Bly, who who basically says, uh, I, "I'm out here where where the uh, transcendentalists were, and it works for a minute, but it kind of quit working on me." <laughs> so, what would you have said to me? Mm -hmm. I, I, <laughs> Any comment on that one? I'm just curious. 
I need to digest it. <laughs> <laughs> well, while you're digesting, let me very quickly, um, you know, I gotta find it, but I, I'd like to read one that I actually wrote. I'm so glad you did the Japanese poetry. I love Japanese poetry. It's ah, yeah, so yeah. simple and succinct. Exactly. Powerful. Yes, so yes. Every, every word, they, they are masters of semiotics. Every word he sp they speak is, has, has multiple meanings and multiple, I, I, I would love to know the, the character, you know, to be able to read it in its characters, because even when, when translated into English, they're, they're, they're incredibly powerful. They, they, they point to three different things at once. Almost every word within the process does that. It's just, it's just yeah. amazing. Yeah. So with that in mind, and, and, and leaving Robert Bly to be digested over here, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is one that, that I wrote several years ago. Cherry Tree Violin plays its silent sonata deep into the autumn night. Frictive hum, sound of the touch of the wind, just by, splendid tulips out of season play a wistful sunshine clarinet. It's a silent crystal celebration. Hear the yellow wisdom. That gets to a, to a, to a thing that I've run across. I, I, as I mentioned, I grew up out in the deep country. And that gets to this, kind of what, what Laura was talking about a few minutes ago, that it's never quite the same. It's never, there, there, there's a celebration going on all around you all the time and it's different, it's a symphony. And it would be great if we could use poetic language to bring our crazy world back to just this ability to hear, this ability to see, just to see the, the bee's wings as it flies. To, um, I mean, there, there's so much going on. To, <clears throat> Excuse me. The the the, big, the the natural world, frankly, is far more interesting than the than the synthetic world, and it, it, it's very difficult to, to get people to understand that. Or, or maybe it's or or maybe they're Robert Bly. Maybe they don't see that. I don't know. Maybe that's not their reality. It, possibly this is our reality, and not theirs. That's, that's a uh, well. A fair I think question. It's thought because if you look at uh, the Welsh, so they have this thing uh, every year. It's called the Esteth Fod. And it's a celebration of music, poetry, all different kinds of art, but mostly um, stuff like poetry and, and storytelling. And it's, it's like a giant event and they have them all over the world, but mostly in Wales. We have a couple of here too that have not been, like they'll have them for a few years and then they'll go mm -hmm. away and other places will pick it up. But I think when you have your whole culture who understands that and it's in your language and it's in your you know, people are like, it's in the pub. It's in the places that people come and socialize in. Then it is, it is just a part of you. It's in you and you look for it and you, you know it when you see it and you create it and you live in it. And I think for me, animism is that, even though, I, I mean, I'm not good with words. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to put that into words, but I, I intuit it. It's in my body, but I think that has to be taught. You know, from the time people are little little people, you have to say, oh, look at this, oh, because the kids lose their magic so easily. I mean, that goes back to Emerson. You know, we all do. It's part of uh, becoming, you know, it's that innocence of a child. And the first thing that happens is the wounding. And that sets you on your path, yeah. Yeah. either away from yourself or back towards yourself. But that wounding has to happen. And, you know, if, if you're a Dallas, yes. then it's all, the path hopefully takes you back to being that child again. But I think for most of us, we just get old and brittle and forget. And poetry is the way back, one of the That's ways true. back. I don't know if I made this clear or not, but if, if study Robert Bly's body of work, he is thoroughgoing an animist. I mean, he, he, he's one of us, but he just has a different take on it. Do I have time to read uh, one more piece? This is, this, this is in the uh, Indian, uh, India Indian tradition. Yes, we do. To have but, but first, I would like short. to yes. Kudos yes. on that last piece, on a technical note, kudos on that consonants and on that sound imagery. Bam. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, the, sound was popping. the sound was popping. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it is meant to be read aloud. Yeah, it definitely mm -hmm. is. Uh-huh. I'm going to try to pronounce this guy's name. 
I'm sorry, bro. I really am. It's Gopi Krishnan Kathor, I think. But I love your stuff. Thank you. And, and I'm sorry about you. I don't know your name, but here we go. This is, a, a, he calls this letter to a leaf. Dear leaf, up in the tree, what are you waving at? Of course you were hiding birds. You let the red ant stumble upon you with his prized dead bee. And you held the breeze twirling in your lifeline and blushed in the evening rain. All that you did well. You took a longing look, wondering if the sun would keep you loving until the end of time. I know you did that. You had your problems and doubts. If love would alter all, be true until then. And so today, when I walk beneath you, I did not care that you had turned red so soon, that you were waiting, waiting for me to come by. There's no disgrace, dear. Losing to the sun, the wind and rain, the last raiment of your breath, we all do, we always do. Like you thought if you broke away from the tree, you could fly. A new life, breathless in the long arms of the river that would there, you would love to be there again, or upon the stone in its hard caress. But then like the others, love simmered in the distance, and as you leaned out to touch, you fell. <laughs> <laughs> Another concept about uh, of nature. That, well, I, I, actually, it's not. It, it, it's a, it's it's this whole na notion of return, of of coming and going, of um, the, the the process repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating itself. Um, with ninety, you know, a lot of failures, few successes, but a whole lot of failures. And again, Mister Kator brings us back to how that cycle in nature is a huge piece of that cycle in our human development, in our, in our, in our humanity. Right. And how, how it's okay if you reach and fall because, um, well, spring's coming. Yeah. And, yeah. And then <laughs> so I, th those are my pieces. I, I could go on and on, but, uh, I, I'm I'm feeling like this could be a weekly uh, series right now because yeah. I'm so inspired. I want to pull out my ruby. To... It's true. It's true. Yeah, you get on a roll. <laughs> yeah, and, and and it's it's also very interesting how I love I love I love the transcendentalists and and it's funny about those guys. They were sort of the first. Uh, they're kind of rock stars in their way, but but they. America had already taken off and was already, it was still pretty much agrarian and by the time the transcendentalists started talking, but, but that whole urban horror had, you know, the, the buzz had become the thing in America. And those guys were sort of, you know, uh, yesterday's news, right? Except to their people. Uh, and they actually created a, 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 a community that, that lasts literally to this day. And I, I always loved the, the transcendentalists. Having said that, they're, they're pretty much every every advanced culture, at least from the Greeks forward, has had uh, a massive history of poetry that that if not if not nature in specifically, it's about this relationship of nature. I mean, nature is just a common theme in, in the, the, the space. I, I mean, you go back to the, to the, the uh, hieroglyphs and, you know, 30,000 year old caves and they're, you know, it, 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 they're nature pictures. They're, they're pictures of trees right. and yeah. animals and what have you. So, so the, the written word, the spoken word has this incredible quality to change the perspective that we have about ourselves and about our relationships, be they relationships with, uh, well, in Bly's case, with his own soul that he can't seem to make happy on, in the field, but, but all these various relationships that, that, that float through this, our, our notions of uh, how we relate to the ground, how, how we go out and step into grass. And, and it's just very important, it's very critical to everybody around the world and yeah, I totally agree with you, Lisa. We could we could do we could do one of these every week. I tell you, okay. there, there's just so much of this, and there's so many theories and so many ways to go about this. So. And I will say, starting off <clears throat> with the transcendentalists and, and Emerson, and mm. and I'm yes. you know, I, uh, this was the first thing I was drawn to, and and oh, it's great. Yeah. They were they they were they as transcendentalists they were romantics. 
me in a literary sense, um, mm. I, idealists um, and individualists. So, so yeah, they, they they're they're a little lofty and happy and beautiful and all things positive, you know. Hippies. They were the first hippies. <laughs> Yes. So, so yeah. So, I mean, it, yeah, it's not all like this, obviously. No. I don't, I don't they, think they, there's anything wrong with that. I think that absolutely we're, not. We're, no. we're all in a circle and, and sometimes we're in that, that space and sometimes we're in a raunchy space and sometimes, you know, it, it's, I think there's all kinds of poetry for all kinds of moods. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Emerson would put daisies in gun barrels. I, I, I love the guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's, how, that's why I like how he says nature <laughs> colors of the spirit. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's it's all things, you know. It's it's these beautiful things, but it's it's all things too. It's not always, yeah. Na nature's not always tricked in holiday attire. You know? that, that's that's a great statement. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope that we have ignited people's uh, curiosity and appreciation for poetry. Um, thank you, Lisa and Rick, for joining us. I'd love to Thank hear the, uh, the listeners' comments. I'm sure you guys, just like us, were just like, oh, waiting to just have your two cents. So please leave us some comments. And if you want to share your poetry, you can do that in comments too. And if you'd like to support us, you can send your donations online from our website at pansociety.net. See y'all next week. And thanks for tuning in. Ciao.